murder, mayhem, and a whole lot of discomfort. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 cringiest moments from Netflix's Tiger King. For this list, we're looking at the most awkward and hard to watch scenes of the docuseries Tiger King. Are they painful to sit through? Absolutely. But you also can't look away. Number 10. Anytime Joe talks about Carol's husband. I wish there was some way out for me. I'd say she found a way out. Joe Exotic and Carol Baskin's feud is epic. Because of Joe's apparent lack of filter, there is seemingly no subject that's off limits when attacking her. But even by his low standards, the way he talks about Don Lewis is messed up. When promoting the theory that Carol Baskin killed her husband, Joe Exotic goes so far as to use some extremely crude editing to make it appear as if he is Don Lewis, speaking to Carol from beyond the grave. Hey Carol, it's a voice from your past. Get me the f out from under the septic tank. Or more specifically, from the septic tank on her property where Joe believes Baskin dumped Lewis's body. If we could ever get the law to go in there and dig up that septic tank. I promise you he's underneath that damn thing. There's nothing like a combination of poor production value and complete disrespect for the dead to make your skin crawl. Number 9. Howard Sings to Carol I think it would be fair to say that Carol is the Mother Teresa of cats. You're so wonderful. <laughs> Love will make a person do crazy things. It can turn the most stoic individuals into bleeding hearts. Or it can prompt a seemingly reserved and mild-mannered man like Howard Baskin to dress up like a caveman slash tiger while his wife leads him around on a leash for professional photos. While Howard's cosplay pics are hard to look at, it is nothing compared to the sheer agony of witnessing him serenading his wife. It couldn't be in springtime. Seeing you in springtime, I never could go. The editing clearly aims to maximize the cringe factor, providing little context to this amateur operatic performance and lingering on it far longer than anyone could want. Number 8. James Gerritsen Drives His Jet Ski Gerritsen is one of the most disliked individual in the entire docuseries. Jeff Lowe already owned the zoo. Joe just wanted to put it in somebody's name and, and continue to be the Tiger Queen. I mean Tiger King. <laughs> <laughs> He's essentially forced into cooperating in an investigation against Joe, then has the audacity to say he's participating because it's, quote, the noble thing to do. I thought about it for a couple weeks, and I was like, do I want to get involved in this? And I thought it was a noble thing to do. So I signed up to be a confidential informant. But thanks to this epically embarrassing footage, he's now also a meme legend. Gerritsen clearly sees himself as a badass, and surely imagined that this jet ski footage would reinforce his image as some sort of rebellious hero. He really postures for the camera, giving his best action star impression, but thanks to the editing and music, the entire thing plays like one big joke. The only person who's not in on it? Gerritsen himself. James Gerritsen's right involved in this damn deal with Joe, and they ain't doing nothing to him. Number 7. Joe telling customers that an employee got mauled by a tiger. Uh, I don't know, it's an emergency. I got an employee that was attacked by a tiger, and he's hurt bad. Episode 2 begins with a shocking accident. Thankfully, while GW Zoo might not have the best safety protocols, everyone springs to action. Joe, in particular, comes across as a dedicated boss. You all right? Stay with me. Stay with me. But then you remember that the moment's being filmed and that Joe loves to put on a show. When he almost immediately makes it a priority to go inform the park guests, you realize just how performative his reaction is. About an hour ago, we had an incident where one of the employees stuck their arm through the cage and a tiger tore her arm off. I can give you your money back or I can give you a rain check. I want to come back at another date. The crazy thing is, he genuinely seems to think that making this announcement will make him look good. Instead, we get a crash course in how not to handle PR in the wake of a crisis. Where the heck did he get an EMS jacket? Was that really a priority? I am never going to financially recover from this. Number 6. Joe talking to the lawyer about the problematic footage. Joe Exotic is a loose cannon, but setting fire to his own studio and killing his alligators in an act of arson? That seemed like a stretch even for him. When that happened, he was out of town or for a funeral. What better timing? Nobody would have ever suspected him of calling to have it burned down. That is, until we're presented with a damning video. This shaky video captures a discussion between Joe and his attorney, in which Joe is made to realize that the footage Rick Kirkham has shot is a major liability. Furthermore, it's heavily implied that Joe should deal with it. Well, where is it now? In my recording studio. And they don't have copies of it or anything? No. 
Joe then seems to confirm that he will make the studio tapes disappear. And who shot this video? John Finley, on Joe's own orders. Nothing like shooting some incriminating footage of you plotting to get rid of incriminating footage. I'll find somebody that needs 10 grand to make a name for themselves. Number five, when Joe reveals he doesn't wear underwear. I'm gonna try and get some good shots, so make sure y'all get me some promo pictures in there. No, I want you up front with a steel camera. It is a real wild ride getting to know the larger-than-life personality that is Joe Exotic. Were he a fictional character in a film, we would label him totally unbelievable. But hey, truth is often stranger than fiction, and he is living, breathing proof of that. Of the many, many personal details we learn about Joe, there are a few we'd really prefer not to have learned. You know, like what he uses those locks for. Believe it or not, in padlock shining shadow. I wear those on the end of my Prince Albert. You wear the padlock? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Is that or the revelation that Joe Exotic does not wear underpants. People just go crazy over them because they're all in animal print. And do you wear these yourself? I don't wear underwear. <laughs> you don't wear underwear? No. Oh. Free ball it. <laughs> Combine the Prince Albert piercing with the lack of underwear, however, and you're hit with one seriously shiver-inducing mental image. Thanks for the overshare, Joe! Number 4. Jeff Lowe showing off attractive nannies to his pregnant girlfriend. Jeff Lowe came onto the scene sometime in 2015. He just brought the persona that he was going to save the zoo, so we dubbed him the Godfather. One of the biggest commonalities between the main characters in Tiger King, in addition to their love of big cats, is their complete lack of self-awareness. Their inflated egos seem to go hand in hand with a fundamental misunderstanding of what people admire. But when it comes to male chauvinism, Jeff Lowe is in a class of his own. He's continuously spouting stomach-churning one-liners about women, sex, and his own success. Little gets you a lot of There you go. Yeah. His comment about the connection between big cats and women is revolting, but nothing can compare to him and his pregnant lady friend looking at nannies. You're gonna bring in one, why bring in one that's not enjoyable to look at? Oh, and that gym comment? Barf. We take Lauren in next Tuesday to be induced to give birth to Sarah Evelyn Lowe. <laughs> and then we get Lauren back in the gym. Number three, anytime Carol talks about her deceased husband. Let the record show, we are not saying Carol Baskin killed her husband. Either way though, whenever she talks about his disappearance, she does it in such a casual and dismissive manner, it's difficult not to feel suspicious. It was in the ground, it was operational, Judy had moved into the property before Don ever disappeared, so how, how would I have then put him in the septic tank? Among the worst such incidences is when she's trying to explain why she couldn't have hidden his body in the septic tank, and essentially outlines why it would make for a great hiding place. Every time she speaks about Don Lewis, it's like she's toying with us. Those who do things in a certain way, whether on purpose or accidentally, get rich. Oh, and let's not forget her explaining what you'd want to put on someone's shoes to get a big cat to kill them. If I were gonna, you know, if somebody wanted to kill you, then they would put like sardine oil all over you, something that the cat wants to eat, not something the cat wants to drool on. Number two, Joe invites Travis's mom to his wedding with Dylan. As seen in the previous episode when he's filming a response to the fire, Joe has a tendency to play up his emotions for the cameras. But when Travis tragically dies, Joe seems genuinely devastated. Please, Lord, look out for those. Her spending this holiday alone without their loved one. Unfortunately, your sympathy for him quickly dries up as he proceeds to meet and marry another young man, Dylan Passage, within two months of Travis's death. You can believe what you want to believe about whether or not things are sent to you or people are sent to you or whatever, but we went to dinner and he never went home. In what seems to be an act of goodwill, Joe invites Travis's mother to the wedding. When she arrives, however, it quickly becomes clear that it's nothing more than a photo op, a chance for Joe to document and share that she seemingly gives him her blessing. Okay, I thought it was gonna be a what, you know. No, it was the cameraman, me, and the flower girl. So on the social media, well, Travis's mom's fine with it, so everybody else should be. Adding insult to injury, according to Cheryl Maldonado, Joe never contacted her again. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications.
Number one, Joe singing at Travis's funeral. We're gonna try and make this not a day of mourning, but a day of celebration to celebrate the life of Travis Michael Maldonado. Joe Exotic does not sing his own songs. Joe's speaking voice is high and nasally, while his faux singing voice is deep and has a classic country sound. If you hadn't figured it out, this live performance makes it painfully obvious that Exotic is almost always lip syncing. This old town where I wanna be, where I'm gonna be. Not only does he appear to be singing over a recording at the funeral, but everything about his performance is just so tone deaf. His delivery is totally inappropriate for the context, as is his choice to perform, period. He has to do dramatics, you know, drama. He has to do a show wherever he goes or whatever he does. He was even acting there. His husband has just died. And still, he can't help but make it the Joe show. And everybody at work saying that's exactly what I'm talking about because you've seen his balls. Honestly, this entire funeral is just one big masterclass in cringe, from talking about Travis's testicles to the quote he attributes to him. And I asked him every day, I said, why me? He said, because God put me here to make you smile, and that's my job. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.